Are there other forms of life out there? Or is Earth just the sole cradle of life in this vast cosmic ocean? Where did life come from? How did life form? Just what is life and why don't we see any form of extraplanetary life, especially intelligent life? To tackle this question, something you may have heard of before, uh, Dr. Frank Drake introduced what we now call the Drake Equation. It's just a tool, a way to estimate how many civilizations in our galaxy might be capable of communicating with us. While it's not an exact science, it's a fascinating way to break down the mystery into manageable, manageable parts. And the point of this video is to combine the Drake equation with the idea of panspermia, um, which throws a little twist in there. So first, we consider the number of stars formed each year in our galaxy, the Milky Way, with its hundreds of billions of stars, continues to birth new stars at a steady rate, about one to three stars each year. This is where everything begins, because without stars, there are, can be no planets. Then we ask, how many of those stars have planets? Thanks to missions like Kepler, we've discovered that most stars do actually have planetary systems, about 70% of them. This is a big deal because it means that there are potentially billions of planets in our galaxy alone, many of which might be capable of supporting life. But it gets even more interesting. Uh, of those planets, how many are in the habitable zone, that perfect distance from the star where it's not too hot, not too cold, but just right for, and this is the key, liquid water to exist. And there's a reason for that. Um, I'll have to go into it. There's a chemical reason for that. Uh, I'll have to go into that in a different video. On average, it's estimated that there's about 0.4 planets per star in this zone, which could mean billions of potentially habitable worlds in our galaxy. Now, here's where uh, the uncertainty really begins. Of those potentially habitable planets, how many actually develop life? Develop life. Think about that. Uh, I was uh, hammering the word abiogenesis in the stream last night. Abiogenesis is the creation of life from without life. Imagine you have a bunch of rocks and water, like how, and, and amino acids, because amino acids are out in space, and they just somehow form into life. Like it's, it's very, it's, it's a, if you if you were to say something is a miracle, that's a miracle. Anyways, th this is a this is a great unknown because in my personal view, I don't think abiogenesis is a common thing. Anyways, we know that life emerged relatively quickly on Earth, which is encouraging, but we have no idea how common that is and if a life emerged or it came from somewhere else. Some estimates put it as low as one in a thousand, that's re which is a little bit ridiculous because um, that's like trying to measure how often abiogenesis occurs. Um, others are more optimistic, suggesting it could happen on every habitable planet. We, in truth, we've never recreated abiogenesis in a lab. We have absolutely no idea how, how life comes from nothing. So putting metrics on that is, is just a little off. Life alone isn't enough. How many of those planets with life go on to develop intelligent life? Intelligence on Earth took billions of years to evolve, and it required a very specific set of circumstances. It's possible that intelligent life is exceedingly rare, or it could be a natural progress progression once life gets started. And if you think about life in terms of uh, its uh, behavior, like, it, it kind of acts like a, an entropic force going, attempting to spread itself as, as much as it can into all domains of whatever the planet or uh, environment that it's in. And then, of course, there's the question of technology. How many intelligent civilizations develop the capability to communicate across the vast distances of space? And like we don't even know the physics for that. Even here on Earth, it's only in the last century that we've had the technology to send or 
and receive signals beyond our planet at the speed of light, which is ri ridiculously slow. I will point out, though, that the Milky Way is around uh, 100,000 light years in length, I believe. Uh, so it's actually, not, it's actually not that big. Finally, there's the issue of time. How long do these civilizations last? Do they endure, endure for millennia or do they self-destruct or fade away before we ever have a chance to find them? The lifespan of a civilization might be the most crucial, crucial factor in whether we detect them. When you put all these factors together, you get a fancy equation, the Drake equation, which gives us a way to frame the possibilities. But it's important to remember that each number is a guess, a shot in the dark. Depending on the values that you choose, you could end up with a galaxy teeming with life, or one more word, just completely alone, both of which, in my opinion, are uh, equally terrifying. S let's connect back to the recent discoveries that add a new twist to this equation. In a groundbreaking study, this is one of my favorite studies, published in Nature, I'm going to show it on screen, Scientists found evidence that life on Earth began much earlier than previously thought, perhaps as early as 4.2 billion years ago, only about 300 million years after the planet itself formed. And the evidence comes from ancient hydrothermal vent deposits in the, I can't say this Canadian word, uh, Nuvaya Gutek supercrustal belt in Quid Quebec, Canada. Hydrothermal vents are like little underwater vo vo volcanoes, like kind of spewing stuff out. Um, these deposits contain microfossils, microscopic structures that bear a striking resemblance to those formed by bacteria living around modern hydrothermal vents. If these structures are indeed remnants of early life, they suggest that life didn't just emerge early, it, it did so under extreme hostile conditions. And I would like to add to that, that if, if life didn't em, like, kind of like, em, if we're looking at this from a pan, like a, a panspermia view where um, life is getting caught up in planetary formation and um, it's in some sort of uh, state, then what it's going to do is it's going to be in that state. It's going to get lodged into the planet and then it's going to get lodged into the planet and it is then going to be searching for water, just like a seed where like, let's say uh, during planetary formation, where is life? Like life isn't what, whatever life let's say is floating out in space, like a little bacteria. Um, it's not like just going to land on top of the planet. It's going to be inside the planet and there's going to need to be somewhere where what's ever inside the planet is released. And a good candidate for that would be hydrothermal vents. So you get water and stuff coming out of the planet. Furthermore, there are energy gradients, which means that like uh, basically there's energy. And uh, life can figure out a way to use energy in order to survive. Uh, and to further that, uh, hydrothermal vents are one of the most extreme environments on Earth, completely cut off from sunlight with temperatures ranging from 50 to 400 degrees Celsius and chemical-rich water spewing from the ocean floor, chemical-rich water that uh, is useful. Yet even here, life thrives, which, you know, kind of makes you, uh, I mean, I think that's one of the ideal places for life to thrive, but it kind of makes you think like, okay, if life can thrive here, it could probably live in the vacuum of space, Not, but in a, in a like cryptosis state. The fact that life could establish itself so quickly and in such an, well, inhospitable or hospitable place, depending on how you look at it, hints at something profound. Maybe life doesn't need much to get started. Maybe, just maybe, it's more common than we think. Maybe it just needs a little bit of energy, a place to be, some water. And what makes hydrothermal vents so special? As I mentioned before, the energy gradients. At these vents, hot mineral, hot mineral rich water from within the Earth's crust meets the much colder seawater creating a steep gradient or a change 
in temperature and chemical composition. These energy gradients are essential because they provide the power needed for life's basic chemical reactions. In environments like these, life can thrive by harnessing the energy released when certain chemicals like hydrogen sulfide rea uh, react with oxygen or other substances. This, this process, known as chemosynthesis, is different from photosynthesis, which relies on sunlight. And um, you think about it, maybe life's trying to like just make its way anywhere and it could it could even land on like something like Europa, which doesn't have much sunlight. So there are other mechanisms for it to live. The concept of energy gradients as a foundation for life is powerful because it suggests that life could emerge anywhere similar conditions exist. On Earth, hydrothermal vents are found in some of the most extreme environments, yet they are teeming with life. If similar energy gradients exist on other planets or moons, perhaps around underwater volcanic systems or even beneath thick ice sheets, then these places too could harbor life. And I did just mention Europa, but Europa and Enceladus, moons of Jupiter and Saturn respectively, Titan, these are both believed to have subsurface oceans beneath their icy crusts, and scientists have hypothesized that hydrothermal activity might occur on the seafloors of these moons. Driven by tidal heating, tidal heating is um, like, uh, you know, like what a tide is? So it's like when the, the giant planet near them uh, just kind of like pulls on it, pulls on it, therefore creating energy gradients. If such energy gradients exist there, the same processes that sustain life around Earth's hydrothermal vents could also operate in the dis these distant oceans. And this idea that life could emerge whenever there are energy gradients offers a universal mechanism for the origin of life that doesn't dis depend on sunlight. It broadens, uh, I would like to say, the origin of life, not the origin, but the uh, ability for life to go from like some sort of seed to life. It broadens our understanding of where my life might arise, making it conceivable that life is more widespread across the universe than we've ever imagined. Now let's tie this back to the broader question of life ex life's existence elsewhere in the universe. The Drake Equation gives us a framework to think about the potential for life, but it's the discoveries here on Earth, like the resilience of life at hydrothermal vents, that give us clues about where else life